Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 66. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Victor Hansen. Mark Victor Hansen is best known as the co-author for the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series and brand, setting world records in book sales with over 500 million books sold. Mark also worked his way into a worldwide spotlight as a sought-after keynote speaker and entrepreneurial marketing maven, creating a stream of successful people who have created massive success for themselves through Mark's unique teachings and wisdom. Mark Victor, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. My great pleasure. Thank you. Love you know, talking about leadership I, I, and good thinking, always. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to share with you a quick story because I think it'll sort of um, bring in the how much I'm valuing our conversation. Uh, so I'm a former educator and school leader. And years ago when I was, I was supposed to head down to Atlanta to interview for a position as head of school. And the weather was just really bad in Atlanta that day. I was sitting on the plane for multiple hours. It was actually the day, the day of, a, of, a, of the AFC championship game of a team that I actually, you know, that I follow. And the whole thing got messed up. So I show up the next day and the outgoing principal says to me, you must be the guy. I said, why? Because he said there were so many obstacles for you arriving here. It must be you really are the one. And so I like reminded of this. I know we had multiple conversations. I, first of all, I'm delighted that you're here and we got this scheduled. Um, I'm excited to hear about your book, which I didn't even mention in the Bible. We're going to talk about that soon. And I'm just excited to pick your brain on some of the real issues related to leadership and related to life. And I, I remember I, I, I've heard some things from your co-author, Jack Canfield, talking about getting a publisher for chicken, chicken soup for the soul. And, you know, sometimes you look at things in retrospect and you say, well, that's a, that's a no brainer. That's a great book, a great series. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's going to want to get that thing published under their name. And then he talks about how you went to publisher after publisher, and you tried so hard to get the very first um, volume released and you couldn't get anyone for, I don't remember all the details, but it took quite some time and quite some persistence so I'd like to talk about persistence because to me, for example, in my line of work, perseverance is critical. So many people, um, they struggle. They think they have a great idea, a great product, a great service, a great business model, and they don't see success immediately and they have to persevere. So what was it about your offering, about your book? What was it just in general about the way you guys approach things that allowed you to push through and say, I don't care how many times we get rejected. We're going to, we're going to stick this out and we're going to make this happen. Um, boy, there's three or four questions hidden all at once there. But first of all, we got turned on by 144 different people. We wow. ultimately went to the book expo ourselves because I've been selling successfully since I was nine years old because my parents had no money and I had to buy my own clothes and all that. So I said, Jack, let's go to the BEA, book expo. America is what it's called. And there are like 60,000 authors. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because my parents were illiterate Danish people, not making them bad or anything. They're smart, but they just didn't know English when they came from the old country. So, you know, I was in remedial reading from first grade to sixth grade. Now I'm suddenly my at 14. My English teacher saw a bright light in my brain and said, you know, if you start reading, you could really become something. And I got to be an addicted omnivorous reader, which I still am. Of course, I've read about touched at least 50,000 books here in my library. Anyhow, um, Jack and I sold it to a little itty bitty publisher named Health Communications. Everyone thinks HCI means Hanson Canfield Inc. And it does not. And then, by the way, when we got turned on by all those publishers, the other thing that happened, the adversity mounts up before you. You have great adversity before you have great success. That's the way God works, it appears to me. Um, and if you've got a different uh, point of view, I want to hear it. But the our agent wrote us a long letter and said, look, you guys, I'm firing you because this book is never going to sell. I've wasted a lot of time with you. And that's cost him tens of millions of dollars. Is that the answer you're looking for? Or are, wow. you, are you at looking for what caused me to be persistent? No, I, I want to I want to get that persistent piece. But I mean, you talked about some other things as well. So I'll circle back on that. But when you when you fee, face rejection after rejection, 
So I know you said you were selling from a young age and, and maybe that was sort of inoculated or the wrong term, but kind of built into your DNA. But my question to you is, so, so what, you know, cause people want to know, like some people talk about failing fast and they say, if it's not a good idea, start something new and failure is okay. But you weren't content to view that as a failure. You saw this as a success. How did you, how did you know to push through and what gave you the, the energy and the stamina to do so? Great question. So what happened is that Jack and I were doing different markets. I was doing the business market. And, and like I said, I was back East in, in Manhattan. And if you can sell there, you know, as Frank Sinatra sings, you can sell anywhere, right? Because they eat their young is the joke on the street. That's right. Um, and I'd been selling pretty successfully there doing business seminars. And Jack was in the education market, but we combined. And when we we're doing, we we're both doing hundreds of meetings a year, and what happened is the audience, I said, oh, that's the best story I ever heard, like Bopsy, or I wish I had a brother like that. Do you have it in a book? And we knew that it would work, and we didn't really want to self-publish at the time. Now it's a great time in history to self-publish just because publishers are having such a rough go of it. And I'm with seven houses, so I'm not beating up on publishers. Just what happened is, because we're talking about leadership and current problems, we thought COVID would last two weeks and the bookstores paid the rent and they didn't pay the publisher. And that went on now for a year and a little bit longer. And the publishers can't send out books if they're not going to get paid. So it has become really problematic. So that makes one major distributor of books, which is Amazon, which we're number one at right now with this book, Ask, uh, which I'm very thankful for. Don't misunderstand. But I want every little bookstore to make it. I mean, I when I came in, there was 19,000 independent bookstores. And Jack and I would probably go in and sign books to all the people who sold there. It's called Hand Along Book and hug them and thank them and appreciate them. And then they help make our book go gangbusters. And we're, ex, you know, a half billion later, it must have worked. So we're very thankful. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that I heard there and all of that you shared that really resonated with me is that you knew you had something successful because people kept telling you, right? You kept getting feedback about your stories along the way. And so it sounds to me that if you're talking with your people, whoever your audience is, your target market, and you know that they like fundamentally, they like what you're offering. So it may be a packaging thing. It may be a marketing thing. It may just be amount of how much effort you've invested behind it. But to me, that sounds like that would be a reason to stay on it, a reason to persist through. Do you agree with that? I believe in persistence. And obviously I've done the same thing for 44 years and been pretty good at it. So in the book business, after going bankrupt before that in the wrong business. So I believe that you ought to get out of the wrong business into the right business. But if you keep, we teach one of the 38 things we do, but I also wrote a book called you have a book in you about how to make every book a bestseller. But the, the point is, is that if you keep getting, we say feedbacks of breakfast of champions, And we were getting that positive feedback. And then when we did Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, publisher says, I have teenagers. They buy CDs, concert tickets, and clothes. I give them $50. They go to the mall, and the mall eats it. And they don't know what happened to it. I don't know if you got any kids, right? Do you have any kids? I do, yes. Yes, How old? Um, From 22 down to eight. Down to eight years old? Yes. That's a great, well, have your range. teenage soul, but you let them read it to you, dad. Anyhow, the, the point, if you don't mind my recommending it, and I'm not trying to hustle one more book. That's not the point. The, the, the point is we sold 19 million because I went to Nickelodeon and I said, look, let's test every story. And we had 250 stories we thought were at 10. And we said, scale on that scale, one to 10, but we're going to take off the name. You won't know if it's Art Buckwald. You won't know if it's Irma Bombeck. You won't know if it's Mark or Jack. And and what happened is we had a 10 plus plus and it, it, the book just exploded. And then we did Chicken Soup for the College Soul because I was now talking at all the big universities with 20,000 people at Ball State. And the president said to me at dinner, he said, Mark, only one in 10 that matriculates start graduating. I said, look, I had to pay my way through college and I got a PhD, but it is not okay with me. It's not okay with Dr. Canfield. I get goosebumps telling you this. I don't know if I'm going too far on leadership, but I said, look, I will, I will champion this book, Chicken Soup for the College Soul, because we've got to get people started and finished because America needs to be the educational capital of the world. I hope you agree with me. Not, not that Israel's not phenomenal, not that there aren't great countries out there, but the point is the world looks to us for leadership because we're talking about leadership. Sure. And we've got to be educated. We've got to be comprehensively educated. And more importantly is after academics, we've got to be self-educated. Graduation does not mean 
you close a book and you're done forever. That's it, right. It says you close that the textbook, perhaps, of whatever the subjects where you studied. And now you read self-help action books like the kind I write. At least that's my belief system. Yeah. And, and that and that college book, I imagine, was very uh, motivating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you picked a subject that I, yeah. I do two things for those that are college kids or have college kids like you do. Um, you, I tell I, I believe all the way through academics, you should never pick pick the subject you want, but then go audit all the teachers before you take the teacher. OK, you find great and yeah. inspiring teachers because they exist in absolutely every subject, which is true. Yes. And, and I, I like the other piece as well, if I may, for a second about the, 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 the self-education and, uh, and really never ending, right? Being a lifelong learner. Uh, right. I, think, I think fundamentally that, I mean, it's part of Jewish tradition. Uh, King Solomon talks about it, that you should educate the youth according to his way so that even as he ages, even as he gets older, he will not deviate. So it really is part of being a person of faith, but it's also part of just being a person of purpose, right? Understanding that no matter what you have learned in your foundational level, you can go you know, well beyond that. And many people do. I mean, especially in today's day and age, I find that, you know, we, we, we can't rely on necessarily a single career. We can't necessarily rely on a single set of skills. We have to reimagine ourselves and continue to find new ways to be really good at what we do and find new opportunities to excel, which I think is a nice segue into your newest book, Ask, because you talk about transforming from dreams to destiny, which you know, could, could be taken in, in, in a variety of different ways. I'm curious to know what you mean by that. But what, do, what do we talk about? When, what, what are you referring to when you say a person's destiny? What is, you know, because we all want to live a, live a life of purpose, right? We all want to live a life where we feel that we have a calling, we accomplish something meaningful. Uh, I do want to get to how the ask piece of it connects to a person's purpose and destiny. That's an important next question. But for the moment, how are you defining destiny? And how do people in your, from your vantage point, you know, start to uncover it and then utilize that to help others as well? I love your comprehensive questioning. And I want to do a comprehensive answer, but it's a little long. But I believe God coded every one of us with a destiny at a heart and a soul level at birth. And what our job is with Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny, is that destiny is the ultimate expression of you at your highest and best. Like, when I was trying to be Buckminster Fuller, Einstein's best student at Princeton, of course, uh, having graduated Harvard and taught with uh, Bucky, I tried to be Bucky because he had written 40 books. He had all these thousands of inventions like geodesic domes, by matching cars. And I thought I was a young hotshot because I understood his stuff, traveled with him for seven years. And I, was, I screwed up and I went bankrupt all at once. Best, worst experience. And I said, well, what do I really want to do? And I kept saying to God, 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 tell me, what is it I'm supposed to do? And God said, you're supposed to talk to people that care about things that matter, that would make a life transformative difference. Well, I go to my roommates in Hicksville, Long Island, New York at the time, and I say, boys, you know anybody that's young, that's not a lawyer, not a doctor, not a celebrity, not a Broadway star, and you know somebody I could relate to, not a cotton top, a white-haired guy like me, that uh, I could relate to. And I said, yeah, this kid's talking out in a hop hog Long Island, New York. He's fabulous. He's a few years older than you. I go out there and for three hours, this guy, Chip Collins, mesmerized the audience. And I said, that's it. That's what I'm supposed to do. I go up to Chip and I ask, I say, can I take you to lunch? He said, you can take me to lunch. What do you want? I said, I want to do what you do. He said, look, Ed, chance you making in this business one in a thousand. You ain't going to make it. Go do real work. And it was a crash time in America. Do you remember oil uh, OPEC in 74 sure. we crashed and burned in America and interest rates are up, oil prices are up, crazy times. And anyhow, he taught me how to do it in a life insurance business. So I did it and did a thousand talks a year the first three years. And then people kept coming up and saying, wow, I love that one story. Do you have it in a book? And I first book I did was stand up, speak out and win. And to little audiences of 10, 20 or 30 people, I sold 20,000 copies in a year. I made $200,000 in 1974. That's like $2 million. I thought I died and gone to heaven. The only mistake I made is I should have written more books earlier. I've written 312 books, but back then I could have written a lot more. I just was, I was dancing high. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, I mean, I like how you really distilled that to those three points. I didn't write them down because they were a little bit too quick for me, but the idea of really understanding your purpose and who your audience is and how you're going to deliver a service or how you're going to deliver some kind of value to them. 
And that, that sounds like, you know, a nice tight way of saying it. So with that, and by the way, we don't necessarily all discover it right away, right? Sometimes we go down, like you said, you went down one path and it wasn't quite there for you. You thought this was going to be it. And then you kind of found it a little bit later. So, I mean, I, I think if we stopped our conversation here, which we're not, but if we did, one of the things that I think is really important that I've already taken away is that, you know, there is some trial and error, certainly in a lot of what we do, but with persistence and with the ability to recognize that, you know, we all have a tremendous gift and we all have the opportunity to really share that gift. The question is, what is it and who will we serve most and sort of really hone in on that. Then the answers will come forth. It may not be from our own conscious, maybe from a subconscious, from a higher power, but there will be a way for that information to be revealed to us. And when we find it, that's when we can make our real purpose in the world or fulfill it. When my wife and I wrote the book, Ask, what we discovered is that you got to ask yourself. There's only three channels. Ask yourself, ask others, and ask God. And let's go to the last one. First, all three are equally important, but I was asking myself and not quite getting it. And so what we're teaching now is you say, and, and I respectfully understand in the Jewish faith, they don't use that word. So you can go to infinite intelligence, whatever is acceptable to you. No, no God is God is good. God is good. Okay, God is good. Yeah. Okay. So I say, God, what is your destiny for me? God, what is your destiny for me? God, is what is your destiny for me? Now let me morph that and say, when we did Chicken Soup, Jack had come up with a title and I didn't like it at all. I said, Jack, look, pal, we're not going to use that title. We're going to use this thought command that, that we saw Napoleon Hill use. You know, he originally was going to call Think and Grow Rich, which has sold hundreds of millions of books, How to Make a Boodle with Your Noodle. And the publisher said, look, Nap, I think this is a dumbass title. If you don't come up with a better title, I'm not going to do it. And he went in and did a thought command, said best-selling title, and came up with Think and Grow Rich and called up the publisher at 2.30 in the morning. And Well, I didn't know that. I never heard that story before. Woke up the whole house. So I said, Jack, let's do the same thing, except you'll do it 400 times in your house. Mega best-selling title, mega best-selling title. God, give us a mega best-selling title. God, give us a mega best-selling title. Well, Jack calls me at 2.58 in the morning because I had a digital clock. This was before cell phone, so woke up the whole house, which didn't make my family very happy at all i'll promise you they didn't think that was a cool idea but jack said chicken soup i said for the soul we both got goosebumps now that may or may not be your corroboration of truth but goosebumps god bumps chili bumps and instantaneous behavioral change is what we <laughs> believe is is a, a way of communing with god and uh-huh. his soul spirit and and it works for us when we're yeah. dealing with the stories that are truth that works plus tears in the eye and a weak knee and a transformation of soul Okay, so then, then clearly this title is 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 uh, you know is something we should talk about a little bit more as well because it really speaks directly to I think what the book is about. So so tell me a little bit more about what what brought you to write this book and how do you see asking as being a gateway to so much in terms of purpose and achievement? Everyone has, back to your question, is everyone has a life path and asking is the only way to find the journey that you're supposed to take. And what happens is, my opinion, and by the way, I'll gladly have you argue against this if I'm wrong, but is it is it people get sucked into, I'm an engineer, I'm a doctor, I'm a janitor, I'm a, a garbage man or a person, right? Because women are garbage people here in Arizona where I live. And, and I'm not opposed to any of that, but that's not their destiny. That's their job, J-O-B. And I say a job makes you just over broke. I want you to find your right livelihood, your vocation that you're passionately purposed about. That is your magnificent destiny. Like I could not write. I mean, it just, it, it is the, I used to be a speaker who wrote and then I got famous as the world's best selling author, according to Guinness Book of Records. And I'm a writer who speaks. We just talked this weekend to 4,000 people and loved it. His seminars are opening up again all over and I get goosebumps telling you that. And I'm very thankful, but my wife and I have traveled to, 80 countries around the world talk live to 7 million people. And we meet great people everywhere we go, educated, personable, nice. But the difference between somebody who succeeds a little and somebody who is vastly successful is one thing only. They learned how to be what we call today a master asker. So when we did the book, we wrote how we came through every difficulty, every adversity by asking. We didn't know that was a formula when we started writing a book. And then we did all the research at Harvard and Cambridge and Yale and Stanford and Princeton. But more importantly, we interviewed the 26 master askers, like the world's best filmmaker has become our close friend, Peter Guber, who's, you know, he made Rocky and Batman and Lawrence of Arabia and I'm the greatest. And then we're sitting with him at dinner and I asked him, I said, Peter, what are you doing? He said, oh, I bought a little sports team today. I said, really? Now, remember, I came out of no money. 
And now I have a lot of fairly rich friend, billionaire friends, but like Peter, but he said, today I bought the Golden State Warriors for 170 million. I said, 170 million? I mean, you understand. I thought if you became a millionaire, you were smoking hot. Well, now he's worth about 3.8 billion with that. And he bought the Dodgers. The point is, Peter started as a little kid, poor kid in Brooklyn with no money at all. And his parents didn't have, I'm not beating up on his parents or anything. I'm just telling you what the story says that he told us. But he started with enterprise value of cutting lawns and then getting all the kids to do that. But then he's in college at Columbia and they're rich and he's poor. He doesn't have a car. He can't take out a girl. He can't buy her a shake or anything. So he said, I got to do something. Finds out they need to do laundry and they don't want to do it. So he goes to the laundromat and the dry cleaner works out a deal. 50 off, gets 20 for himself, gets 17 kids to do it. Made so much money by the time he graduates. Not only does he graduate head of his class and you know that part of the story, but he marries the girl who's still married, you know, 58 years later. That's We're talking about a guy that looks 40 and is 80. We've exercised with him twice a day. So this guy's a mensch, which is a word I'm convinced you know. I God definitely do. He's got it together. But Peter is so amazing. He had so much money that he took his, would you like to think about this 50 years ago, you may not have been born, but if, if you were there alive, then could you imagine taking your wife on a world around trip for one year with the money you'd made by just cleaning kids clothes when you're at school? Wow. And that's, that's all because he started to ask himself, what's the enterprise value here that nobody else is doing that'll make me better off, them better off, and even a dry cleaner and the laundry better off. So I'm glad you sort of ended with that because I wanted to clarify. I'm not sure that when I asked the question, I was sufficiently clear about the, the actual act of asking, right? So typically speaking, if you say, I need to ask, I'm asking somebody else, right? I'm asking you, let's say, quote, for a favor. I'm asking you for an opportunity, that kind of thing. But it sounds like you're talking about asking yourself and asking the three that you talked about earlier. So if you could just ask clarify, yourself, ask others and then God, I, I really believe you got to ask yourself and God first, and then you got to ask others. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're really tuned into the infinite, which look, you guys wore yarmulkes, right? And I, right. I believe that's because the crown chakra is where infinite intelligence comes in. Now I have no way of proving that I, maybe we could do it with curly and photography. I've never said that before. So if you have an, any objection or a difference of opinion, I'm, I'm open because I'm just, I'm sharing with you openly. I said, I talk out loud, think out loud. And then I try to write to it and see, does it, I look every perspective I can polyocularly and say, does this really make sense? Is this correct? Is somebody going to attack? Because, you know, I'm the biggest, so I got a target on my back. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you're asking those questions and you're, you're really looking towards purpose, then lots of things open up for you. I, that's what I think is it let's go deep on what you just said I believe the hardest question most people have is what do I really want because they say well I'm pretty successful as a car dealer I'm pretty successful as a blank whatever blank is right yeah but is that your right livelihood is that what makes your heart sing is that what gives you Joe Campbell let's say bliss because he says a myth is something that never was and always is what is the mythical you what is the perfect idyllic you and when the game's over for me, I want to have sold a billion books. Now, a lot of people would tell you I can't do it because I've only sold a half billion, but no, before I did it, nobody had done it. And, and the other day, I'm on the biggest show with Amazon bestseller list with Mark Devereaux, who I love. And Mark starts the show saying, Mark, you are the uh, um, Roger Bannister of books. I said, wow, what a great metaphor because Bannister, as you know, 1950 yeah. medical doctor ran a four minute mile, but the next week, do you know that 119 people did it? I didn't know it was that many. Theologically, we were no different. I didn't know it was that many, but I knew others had done it. The point is, he was the guy that broke the ceiling, yeah. broke the barrier. And, and sure. I'm breaking the barrier in books. And, and Mark said, so tell me why that works. I said, I got goosebumps telling you this again. I love our interview here today. Is it? I said, look, two years ago, there's no such thing as a trillion dollar company. And today we have five. Why? Once somebody breaks it, they change the state of consciousness. And that's really what we're talking about here with asking. Asking. I've never said this either, is the only thing I think that breaks the state of consciousness. That's why throughout the Bible, it, it's asked. I mean, Moses is talking to God and he said, wait a second, you come, I, I, I don't know if you agree with the next thing, but my read <laughs> is that he stuttered. Do you buy that? Well, he did have a speech impediment, yes. Speech, whether it's stuttering or whether it's just right. a speech impediment. Or yeah. general mouth. He clearly says, I'm not a man of words. I'm not a man of words. So he says, yeah. good, I'll tell you what to say. And you tell your brother, Aaron, what to say. Right. Aaron screwed up a little bit, but other than that, that's how I read it. But the point is he doubted himself. 
it's human to doubt. And that's why in, in ask, we say, look, there are seven withholds to asking. So first sent to self-worth, which Moses had some little problems with doubt. Then you got fear. Then you got naivete. Then you got excusology. Then you got pattern paralysis. And the one that we're suffering most today, my opinion, again, other than self-worth, all of us have some of it, some of the time, is disconnection. Because I go into a restaurant and you got a family of five or six people and they've all got a cell phone in their hand and they're talking on a cell phone. They're not, they are not in touch with each other. And in my family, we're, we got five kids and six grandkids and going to probably have 12. We say no cell phones at any meal. If you're with dad and mom, no cell phones, period. Yep. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I do. I think it's, I think it's critical in today's day and age. We see it all the time, not just at restaurants, like you said, at people's dining room tables. You know, they're just, they're just totally not with the people that they're sitting with and they feel like they're going to get more and find something better out there somewhere when the real opportunity lies right in front of you. So and the opportunity goes back one stage, it lies within you. you. When you come to a meal, what do you want to say at that meal? Like we say, what's the best thing that happened to you today? What's the worst thing? What did you fail at? And what did you succeed at? Because if you failed at some, I can help you get over the failure because I've had as much yeah. failure as anyone in the planet, right? And so the point is, what do we want to do? Because all of us are a human becoming. We're not even human beings. We're under a total process. And, and that's the other thing. I want to just get in the question you asked three questions ago is about ageism. It was subtle to the question, but I wrote a book with Art Linkletter and, and we said, and he, he was 98 and, and uh, you know, he said, look, you should never retire from something and nothing. Just put on new tires and go in a new direction. In, in other words, retirement at, at the highest death rate in the world in America is at, at the villages because they got 500,000 people all over 55 years old and 12% of them die here. Well, obviously old people die, but they die because they haven't got something back to what you said so brilliantly. Mm -hmm. You got to have a passionate, something that you're passionately purposeful about, worthwhile. And then when you look back, you say, that was really good. And let me just give my hitchhike because I'm addicted as a reader. I want every senior that isn't working to contribute free readership back in our schools because 75% of the kids in California now are graduating and are, are incompetent at reading. That's wow. not okay. Not, no. in, not in America. Not yeah. now. And you're speaking to an educator. So you're only, uh, you know, reiterate as a parent as well. Yeah. Um, so I think you're hitting on some very important points in today's uh, environment with, with, between technology and just people feeling very rushed. You know, the idea of just, I'm sort of imagining, and we do this on, on Shabbat, you know, for the Sabbath, it's a real time to kind of slow things down. Of course, we power down. So there's really no technology at all, but it's a time where there's real intention. Like you're sitting down at the table there's purpose to it. It's not just to feed yourself. It's to connect with others during the week. That's much more difficult for us, different schedules, different factors, but you know, every, if everything you do, I know it's hard to say, but, or hard to actualize, but if everything you do has a purpose, and by the way, I think the purpose precedes the ask in a sense, because I know that I'm here for something bigger. So then I'm going to ask for that clarification. I know that relationships are important to me. So I'm going to ask myself how to build better relationships. It's the question comes from something behind it. It's not curiosity for its own sake. It's, you know, something being driven by, by something deeper and more purposeful. And then the ask becomes the clarifier. That's kind of how I'm taking it. I agree, but let's just talk to your kids because passionate purposefulness, if America's to stay the greatest country in the world, we've got to get back to free enterprise. And because I had to work since I was nine and one of the many bestsellers I wrote is called Richest Kids in America. And in this Tulsa talk with 4,000 people, this mature woman comes up to me. I wrote the book 12 years ago and I, I, I didn't recognize her quite honestly. And, and she was one of the kids that made a million dollars before 19 years old as one of the greatest young artists. She started selling paintings at four years old. By the time she was 12, her average show was uh, $12,000. By the time she was half, 12 and a half, she was making $20,000 a day in artwork. The point is everybody's got some talent. And, and uh, you know, Elon Musk made $500,000 when he was 12 years old and he's one of my heroes and he's an addicted reader and he's from South Africa and all that. And his parents are really smart and God bless him. But the point is I'm saying that every kid has got more than just their science project, more than just, you know, that they, they need to know that they could 
have pride of ownership, which precedes pride of ownership or whatever they want to buy. In my case, it was a bicycle, but I, I'm not pushing anything except saying that we shouldn't delay kids until they're 18 or 21 or 25 to get it to get to WORK for M-O-N-E-Y. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. And so, so I think that's a great way really to wrap up the segment. It's like, give somebody like you talked about Roger Bannister before that analogy. Once I know that there's something beyond the here and now that I can go faster, I can go higher. If I just set my sights to it, then all of a sudden we unleash all of this talent, all this opportunity, all of this creativity and, 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 and good stuff. And, and I think, you know, you have, you have accomplished really so much on, on many, many levels and, you know, raised, raised the bar um, for people like myself. I mean, I've written one book and when I hear you talking about hundreds of books, I'm just like, oh, wow, I've got some work to do, uh, but hopefully not too late. Four at a time. What's that? I recommend you write three or four at a time. I want to go backwards. When kids work, like when I was 16, the Beatles came on, that won't mean much to you, but I started a rock group and I was a bass player, but I booked, we were booked six nights a week and it made a lot of money enough to go to college and I blew it because I didn't have money consciousness. I had a poverty consciousness. But the point is, is that my grades and every one of the five band members that were working for me and with me, you know, all grades went to A's because now we're working at night. We had to get up at five or six in the morning, study, and then go to school. Our grades went from low to high because Hmm. we, back to you, we were passionately on purpose about getting grades and we didn't have any time to waste. There was, most people waste too much time. They are squandering their life because they don't know Parkinson's law, which time yes. stands or contracts based on, on how much time you got to do it. So if I tell you, you got to write a book in a month, guess what? And it's meaningful and purposeful. You get done in a month. Nice. Okay. So now we're going to transition to the yes, rapid fire segment. These answers are short and sweet. And because you've accessed so many people in your life, and I'm sure have uh, stories about so many others. My question for you is if you had one hour with one person who you never have otherwise, or could never have otherwise met maybe a historical figure, who would it be? I think I'd like to meet the apostle Paul. He just, the guy is the poet laureate. I know it's the New Testament, but the guy was really, uh, he spoke seven languages and just pulled off really good stuff and came from hating Christ to liking him. So for me, I'd like to see that guy. I mean, he had a Damascus Road turner on. You may or may not know this. Yes, yes, I'm familiar. Your favorite book genre? Sorry, my favorite book what? Genre. Favorite type of book? Oh, favorite is probably self-help action books, although I'm really good at reading novels. I mean, I'm a, when, when I get a vacation, which has uh, been not happened for the last year and a half, really, um, I'm a good novel reader and I'm fast and I love good novels. Good. Excellent. And the last one, the topic that most folks ask you to speak about. How to outperform yourself totally and how to pull off leadership that you, that no one else could do, because I really believe today we, as I told you, my admiration for Elon Musk is just, I mean, here's a guy who was told he couldn't build any cars, decides to make ventilators, and then makes 90,000 cars and becomes the richest guy off and on in America. I mean, that pulsates a little bit, but basically he's going to electrify America. Now he's got satellites. Now he's got training stations. He's doing really way cool stuff. And what he shows, back to what you said two paragraphs ago, in my mind, is what, what the question you and I got to ask about purpose, what is it that one person can do to really be, go from success to significance? And I think he's showing us all the path. I love it. Success is significant. So let's talk a little bit about how people can find you, learn more about your work, what you're up to, and really benefit even more from your wisdom and your experience. Well, we'd love everyone to go get a book. If you can get it at the bookstores, we sold out. Now they're back again. And uh, otherwise you can get it at Amazon and you can get it in every flavor you want. You can get it in audio. You can get it any flavor you want. You can get it in. We're very thankful for that. And that's number one. Um, then we'd like people to go to askthebookclub.com. We're doing a free book club to become a master asker. And then if you're going to write a book, we want you to go to hansoninstitute.com and we'll just take you to writing a book because I think what happens is when people decide to write a book, they start to, when you wrote your book, didn't you start to read more, think more, get clearer on yes. your purpose and know who you yes. really were? Yes. I had a little bit of a different path because I wrote the blog post first and then I pieced it together afterwards, but I did identify all the gaps as well as I was going through it to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And I was writing for new leaders. So mine is all about how to help people who are transitioning from uh, the rank and file, so to speak, getting promoted what is leadership all about? What's the opportunity? And what are the steps you need to take to make sure it's successful? Short and long term. You to get even clearer. It even sure did. In the adding. 
It sure did. And also helped me reflect a lot on my own experience and all the mistakes I made. And there were a lot of them. Yeah. There were and a lot all of, them. of us make them. You can't, you yeah. know, this is a learning. Look, we're in the university of life and the university of life is going to be edifying or debilitating depends on your attitude. That's right. And I, by the way, could never do what I do now in terms of training leaders and all the, the, the seminars and things. If I didn't make all those mistakes, reflect on them, understand them better, and then figure out how to teach it in a better way to other people. Okay, so one, one final life lesson. You've given us so much, Mark, uh, Victor, and I, I, I really do appreciate the time, the wisdom, the stories, everything. Uh, but if you could just end with one final life lesson, that would be, um, I guess you'd say the cherry on the top of this great conversation. Good. Well, in ask, we say it's the size of your question that determines the size of your result. So if you ask little piddly questions like, what am I going to do after lunch? That's pretty uh, perfunctory, if you don't mind my using a big word. Sure. And, and, and if you ask, you know, how am I going to become a millionaire? What Jim Rowan taught me years ago is that becoming a millionaire isn't getting the million. It's about who you become because of the trials, travails, the fiery hoops you've got to go through. The, the tragedy, the triumph, the overcoming all the odds, right? And, and we're all here to ask ourselves, what is it I want to be? What is it I want to do? And what is it I want to have to have a life of fulfillment where I manifest my destiny? Wow. Okay. Well, I do know that the wait was certainly worthwhile. And I'm so, <laughs> so glad that you said yes. My pleasure. How busy you are, and I know that you have so much going on, and um, we don't have a previous relationship, so um, I, I don't take that for granted either. But thank you for sharing wisdom, for being sensitive not only to to my faith and my religion and all of that, but also just in general to enlightening the lead to succeed audience, um, to you know your experiences, and, and hopefully will inspire us to think bigger, ask the right questions, and uh, and find our deeper purpose. Excellent. Thank you for having me on. You got it. It was really my pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 